So welcome back. My name's Damien, and um, I'm doing this month's Monday night. So at Tara Institute here, each month a different person leads the Monday night introductory classes. And I am doing this month, and um, I try to base the topic always on something that's going through my own mind or in my own experience. And so I had been thinking about um, the, uh, let's call it a gap, a gap between my knowledge and then my actual practice. And so, uh, like I was saying last year, I have uh, been involved for a very long time and, you know, uh, in some context I have acquired a lot of knowledge. Uh, from reading many books and listening to lots of teachings, but there is definitely a gap between my attitudes, my thinking, and my practice. And so there's a Tibetan saying, which I heard many years ago, which always uh, made a big impression on me, and that is that, that you know, you have to be very careful that if there's a gap, if there's a gap between your knowledge and your practice, and then at the end of this life, that gap is big enough that the person can slip through. And what it means is that at the end of this life, that all that knowledge that you had uh, doesn't actually benefit you because of the contradiction between your knowledge and your practice, you know, your daily life, your, your daily experiences, the way you interact with other people, when that's in contradiction to these sort of values that you hold highly or the, the ethics that you subscribe to, that when there's a gap, the, this saying, this traditional sort of Tibetan saying is indicating that at the end of this life that you, you can slip through that gap which means that it, the, your knowledge has not had an impact on your, the value of your life. And so this, this uh, example is applicable to any religious practice, you know, like to Christianity or whatever like that. You can say exactly the same thing, that the, the uh, teachings of the faith, uh, uh, this, this and this, you know, and the, the, um, the aspiration that a person has is to be you know, Christ-like or like a saint or this, that, follow this, do that, don't do that. But then there's the actuality of their practice. And so there becomes a gap between the practice and the knowledge. So, uh, and that that gap is big enough that at the end of this life, then all of that knowledge does not actually benefit you because your practice is in contradiction to it. So the same in Buddhism. The, there's you know, uh, a lot of knowledge, and so a lot of people have been coming here regularly to the Monday nights, and we have, I think, the, the way I sort of approach this, we have, let's say, a natural, a natural ethics. You know, maybe from being human, you know, there's something very special about being human, and maybe from being human we have a, a natural ethics. And... So we can sort of say that there's, there are natural human good qualities that, that uh, I think to some degree we are all aware of. Natural human good qualities. We are aware of those. You know, we know that they make for a good society. We know that they make for a happy family. We know that they make for a happy workplace. We know that they make for a peaceful world between countries, between races, between cultures, between different people. So we know that this natural human ethic does make for a happier world. But then there's my own behaviour in relation to others. And so my own behaviour in relation to others may not reflect that natural human ethic, you know, the natural humanity ethic. And it may not reflect the Buddhist teachings ethic, it may not reflect the Christian ethic, it may not reflect the Muslim ethic or the Jewish ethic or the Hindu ethic. And so we all, we all are faced with this idea of there being a gap between our 
our actual being, our practice, our attitudes, our, our um, anger, our, our misbehaviour, etc. There's a, a gap between that and the things that if somebody asks, if somebody says, you know, what is it that would make your life meaningful? You know, what is it that is of some real value to you? And we'll all trot at, we'll all happily trot at, oh yes, love and compassion, kindliness, you know, generosity, letting, you know, live and let live, golden rule, this and that. We happily trot all of these slogans at, you know. Quite happily, we can rattle off a whole lot of stuff. But in practice, my own attitudes, my own sort of uh, wild thinking is following a different, a different agenda, you know, a very self-centered agenda or a very, um, the, the agenda of a scoundrel, you know. So we have, these, we have this sort of problem. So think the, the basic topic that I'm sort of trying to address this month is, you know, what, what are the techniques to, first of all, to see this within myself? You know, what is it within myself where I can see this? You know, this disconnect, this disconnect between maybe an aspiration that I have and then the, the actuality of my thinking. And trying to understand then why is there this disconnect and why is that, that um, mismatch so difficult to bridge, you know, that when we become aware of this, we sort of uh, quite realistically find that it's actually very difficult to change our mind, to change our attitudes to really revise our behaviour is, is actually very difficult. So, we, we can say that if, if we come back to a beginning point, you know, I, I want to be happy, I want to be free from suffering, and, um, you know, this life, to make this life meaningful, to, to you know, this a general statement from a Buddhist point of view to make this life meaningful then benefit others benefit others and if you're not able to benefit them well at least don't harm them you know as a guide so let's say a starting point for an aspiration in life is benefit others and if you're not able to benefit them well at least don't harm them so it might seem to us that that's a very low target, but the reality is that, that even for us to do that is difficult. To fully do that is difficult. So we, we have this aspiration. I want to benefit others. I'm not going to harm them. But in reality, I, my miserliness, my self-centeredness, my uh, jealousy, my pride, my arrogance, my competitiveness prevents me from benefiting others. You know, very hard to benefit somebody that you're jealous of. Very hard to, to benefit somebody that you're very arrogant and su feel superior to. Then the next step is very easy to harm somebody that you're competitive with. Very easy to harm somebody that you're angry with very easy to, to harm somebody that you think is interfering with your happiness or interfering with your, your progression or your wealth, your, your health, your, your fame, your reputation. It's very easy to, to harm them. So to then start to, to look and see how this uh, battle. There's a battle almost raging within us and we're not aware of this battle but there is a battle going on and the battle is between this aspirational, you know, let's say an aspirational thing to, you know, I want to benefit others and not harm them. So this is like an aspirational thought and even it's a thought that can be based on a great logic that sees that, that doing that 
is of immense benefit to myself and immense benefit to everybody that I come into contact with. If I can benefit them and not harm them, that that is, that is so beneficial to everybody that I come into contact. So there's no question about the value of that. You know, we don't lack knowledge about what is valuable. You know, we are not missing any knowledge. That's a really important point, I think, that we are really, we are really not lacking any knowledge about what is actually beneficial in life, how to make one's life meaningful. We can approach it in this very simple way, benefit others and not harm them. Okay? But we, in practice, we've got a whole lot of reasons why not to benefit others. And we've got a whole lot of reasons why to humiliate others, to harm them, to, to badmouth them, to, to uh, push them away, to deny them different things. We've got lots and lots of reasons to do that. But to see this contradiction between uh, those maybe very short-sighted reasons or very limited reasons or, or reasons based on uh, a very uh, mm, a basis which has no real value or a, a very shaky basis. So what I mean by this is that, uh, let's say, for instance, uh, if we talk about uh, being externally focused, seeing, and, and we cannot be blamed for this in a way, that if we are, like I mentioned last week, we are, we are creatures, we, from the Buddhist sort of presentation, we abide here in what's called the desire realm. The desire realm. This is called the desire realm. And it's called the desire realm because we are dominated by our sensual desires, taste, touch, smell, hearing, sight, whatever, you know, the, the senses. We are, we are beings who are, are so, so strongly engaged in our sensory experiences. So it's called the desire realm. So it's not unreasonable then that we make this jump to think that, well, my happiness is going to be entirely dependent on me acquiring all of the good sensory experiences because they are so immediate to us. The taste, touch, smell, sight is so immediate to us that it's, it's sort of almost forgivable in a way that we think 100%, well, my happiness will come from having all good tastes, all good touch, all good sounds, all good smells, all good, what have I missed out? Whatever. You know, that we, we think that perfection, the perfection of my happiness will come from the perfection of my sensory engagements, the perfect companion, the perfect house, the perfect car, the perfect job, hearing the perfect praise, having fame, you know, which again is a hearing, you know, people f praising you. That fame, that hearing good, you know, hearing praise, that will make me happy. So we, this is the dependence on the sensory that we engage with, and so it's almost sort of forgivable that we think uh, that a hundred percent my happiness can come from that. But we are misunderstanding that there is this sort of sensory engagement, and then. Separate to that is our actual mental state, that our mental state is a different thing. So there's this physicality of our sensory engagement. These are all physical engagements of our senses to the external object. But our mental experience is, it's related, our mental experience is related, but our actual mental experience itself is an internal experience. 
and it is separate to the external sensory contact. And so, as, as Geshe Doga was explaining in the study group this week, uh, and he was, he was saying it like this, he said, you know, that the, the external object and the subjective mind, so my mind and the, the desirous object, you know, that the contact is just boom, like that. It's just contact. And in that moment of contact, there is some happiness. There is some engagement, some happiness. But it's like that. And then gone. Gone. And we pursue that all our lives. We pursue that, that moment of sensory contact. You know, boom. But it, if we examine it, we can see that it just goes instantly. So, you know, the... The taste of chocolate or the, the warm water, you know, the warm ocean, the cooling ocean water, the warm sunlight, the, all of these examples that they give, that, that, that moment of, of initial contact feels pleasurable, but the essence of the cold ocean water is, is cold, and it dawns on us after a period of time that it is unpleasant. And the essence of the hot, warming sun is that it's hot, and it, and it dawns on us after a period of time that it is unpleasant. And so we have this, this changeable sort of experience so that the, the moment of pleasure, the moment of pleasure is just that thing. It's just the tiniest contact. And then, then we're either bored or we're protective or we're fearful of losing it, or we are, we are jealous of others having better, or we are competitive that others might take it off us, and so we contaminate it by our mental processes. And so if we examine that, if we examine that situation, we can start to see that it's actually our mental processes, our thinking, our attitudes, our um, state of mind is actually far more important in terms of our happiness than this mere sort of external contact through our senses. And that's why we can go through our whole lives accumulating wealth, accumulating the most beautiful companions, accumulating the most beautiful clothes, shoes, cars, whatever, food, furniture, television, whatever it is. Accumulation and effectively all not satisfying. So we can come to the end of our life of this incredibly materially indulgent life and find ourselves completely dissatisfied. And it's because we don't understand this, um, the importance of the internal mental happiness, and we have completely overblown the value of the, of the external sensory experiences. And so, so if we, again, you can say that um, if we are totally focused on the material gain and the sensory experiences, and our aim is to be happy, well, there's a gap. There's a gap in that approach as well. There's a gap there because the material pleasures, let's call them pleasures, cannot produce a lasting mental happiness cannot. You know, that the cause of mental happiness is a mental state which is suitable to be a cause of happiness. You know, it is not, it is not the objects contacting the senses. So, you know, Politicians like to talk about closing the gap, and it's a really valid argument in the political social context when they talk about it. But we also need to close the gap. And so the, the gap that we're closing here is this gap between our aspirational, our asp aspirational life, you know, let's say wanting two, two aspirationals, wanting to be happy and wanting to be free from suffering. Every, every living creature has that aspiration. And then trying to make this life meaningful 
by uh, recognizing that benefiting others and not harming others is um, something that will make my life meaningful. And then seeing the tension between, you know, we think there's a tension. We think there's a tension between me wanting to be happy and wanting to be free from suffering. We think there's a, a contradiction from that to the idea of benefiting others and not harming others. See, we think there's some tension between those two ideas. And so that is such a sort of misunderstanding of what the actual causes of happiness and the causes of being free from suffering are. But, but this is what we do. We misunderstand this process. And so we think, we think that uh, my happiness is served by being angry. We think that my happiness is served by being miserly, by being arrogant, by being, uh, su having a sense of superiority. We think that my happiness is served by lying, cheating and deceiving. You know? And we build up habits. We build up habits where we, we can rationalise to ourselves, look, it's just a small lie because I, I'm just protecting myself. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm just sort of, uh, you know, it's necessary, you know, it's, uh, and if I give this away today, what will I have tomorrow? So I'm not giving, I'm not being generous, I won't be generous because I need this. And so there's this grasping, grasping feeling. So the more we dig into it, we start to see that, let's, let's say in that example of that, the miserly mind, the grasping mind, we start to see that, that that grasping mind, which we, we rationalise that this holding on will make me happy, but if we actually look at it, you find that that grasping, holding on mind is in itself actually suffering. You know, that that mind itself, tight, holding, grasping on mind, is in itself actually a form of suffering. And, but we're doing it because we think it's a f cause of happiness. You know, the mind that lies and cheats and deceives, again, we do it because we think that it's a, co a path to happiness and to be free of problems, to be free of difficulties. But the reality is that that mind, that deceptive, deceiving mind in itself, the experience of it within me is in itself suffering. So we can actually see this. And so, really, we have deceived ourselves to the most extraordinary level that we think that anger is beneficial. We think that, you know, I, I will really show this person, I'll retaliate and I'll harm them and I'll completely free myself of these problems. But the reality is that we're just engaging in a very, very... Uh, manifest a form of suffering you know our our whole being is actually uh, absorbed in this suffering you know both that has effects on our health on our physical health our heart our circulation and it has effects on on our mind as well that we are disturbed by that by that anger so to understand this this sort of like whole network of contradictions that, you know, we can say, oh, life is easy, life is simple, I just want to be happy and I want to be free from suffering. You know, that's my motto. My motto is, I want to be happy, I want to be free from suffering. And a meaningful life, well, that's a meaningful life is one where you're, uh, you're benefiting others and you're not harming them. That's my motto. That's my life. You know, we, see, we can very easily say these things. But if we start to examine in detail what's going on, we see that we are actually working very much in contradiction to those. And we're working in contradiction because we are, we are subject to a great deception about what the actual causes of happiness are and about what the actual causes of suffering are.
to understand that deception that we've somehow got ourselves into. So this is this is a sort of a gap, the gap between the aspiration and then the reality of what we're doing. And the reality of what we're doing is because of this incredible deception that we've somehow got sucked into. And to understand how that works, how that how how those, how is that deception working, and then to to find the methods that can overcome overcome that deception. So one of the one of the important things really is to become aware of that process. You know, to to start to actually see this this sort of self deception. This uh, you know, in a way, we're lying to ourselves a little bit, and uh, to, to try to actually see that, and to, to be able to see that, we need to have need sort of two mental qualities. One of them is mindfulness, which is sort of like an awareness, being in the moment, being aware of the moment. Uh, you know, seeing your trail of thought, one thought to the next thought, uh, being able to identify them, and then the these. That's called mindfulness. Then the other, the other mental sort of quality to develop is what's called introspection. And introspection is a, is a state of mind which is sort of riding on the back of the mindfulness. It's able to identify. It's able to make a call on, on whether that state of mind that you have, that you are now aware of, it's able to make a call as to whether that's beneficial or not beneficial. So it's a bit of an intelligence. It's called a, like a discriminating intelligence that is able to uh, tell you uh, this state of mind you're in right now is not particularly beneficial. It's not beneficial. Time to change it. So it sort of can alert you to that. And then the mindfulness can then change, change your state of mind. So those, those two qualities are particularly developed through, through meditation. And so even simple meditations, breathing meditation, for example, by performing those meditations to the best of our ability by focusing and holding our focus. And in that process of holding our focus, we basically subdue all of the, uh, let's say, in that moment of focusing on the breath, we are subduing all of our negativity. You know, so we actually, we are subduing all of our distractions, all of our uh, hatreds, all of our resentments. So for, if we meditate for two minutes, then we will have two minutes where we have no hatred, no resentments, no pride, no jealousy, because we are focused just on the breath. So when we do the meditation, it's important to put in that effort to focus just on the object that you're engaging with. So in the case of a breathing meditation, focusing just on the breath. And so for that few minutes, we can gain a holiday from all of our distractions and negativities and uh, bad memories, resentments, jealousies. We can give, give ourselves a real break. And in that focusing process, we are then developing mindfulness and alertness. So when we finish the meditation, the benefits do not finish. The benefits continue on and we can generally, gradually uh, cultivate mindfulness, mindfulness and alertness. So let's uh, do some meditation. So adopt a good comfortable position. Main thing is to to try to have your back fairly straight whether you're sitting on a floor, sitting on the floor or sitting on a chair, standing, lying down, whatever have your body aligned, you know, like balanced, your body balanced left to right, back straight. And uh, become aware of your mind, your concentration, what's, what's going on in your mind. 
and bring your concentration within yourself, bring your focus within yourself. Let all of the memories, sounds, thoughts, feelings, plans, future, past, let it, let it all go, just drop away and bring your mind in down to a state of no thought and then turn your attention to the breath and hold the uh, appearance of the breath in your mind like a hundred percent hold it without any distraction no other object just the breath and we'll, we'll do that for a few minutes as you breathe in and out in a very uh, unforced natural calm manner 100% on the breath So just relax your mind a little bit and review what happened in that meditation. So just identify whether you were just focusing on the breath or whether you were distracted or daydreaming, sleeping, your mind wandering. So it's important that we have um, some examination of our meditations so that we we know what happened and then to take corrective action if we need to so um, yeah my mind was a little bit distracted so we'll you know we'll let's just we'll repeat the meditation just for a very short time maybe one or two minutes and enter the meditation with a very strong determination to keep the focus 100% on the breath and, and see if for a short period that we can um, maintain that 100% focus just on the breath. So let's repeat the meditation, uh, making a very particular effort to stay focused. Just relax your concentration a little bit. Now we will attempt a, an analytical meditation. So in an analytical meditation, we, we use the power of our mind to examine a particular point or topic. And so we use the intelligence and the analytical ability of our mind to understand something. So tonight, 
uh, I have made the assertion that 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 I am deceived by anger and jealousy, for example, that I'm deceived by them because uh, I think that they benefit me. I think that they benefit me, and that's why I engage in them. I, I, I cultivate the mind of anger and I cultivate the mind of jealousy, thinking that there is some benefit for me in, in having those attitudes. And I am saying tonight that I am actually deceived by those, by anger, and I'm deceived by jealousy. So we can just spend one or two minutes using whatever reasons we, we have, whatever intelligence we have, to examine that question. Am I deceived? Am I deceived by my anger and my jealousy? And uh, so let your, your discriminating intelligence uh, ponder that question and, and analyze this circumstance. Am I deceived? by my anger and my jealousy. So let's spend a minute or two examining that. And just bring your concentration back to the room. So the way we can do those analytical meditations is actually to, to use your life experience. So to use circumstances in your life, maybe something from today or yesterday or something that's, that's very clear in your mind. And so you can have a look and to see, you know, what was my experience in that circumstance? What... What was my anger or my jealousy? What was it based on? How did it, how did it actually work? You know, what, was, what was my expectation from having jealousy? Did, you know, what was the outlook? What was my actual experience? You know, and after it passes, was there benefit? Was there harm? So we can analyze, we can analyze like that our own life experience by focusing on that, that one little aspect and examining it. And if we keep doing that, we actually will develop an intelligence and a, an understanding that helps us to change our, our behavior and change our way of thinking. So we've got some time now for some discussion or questions or whatever. So. Yep. Well, I can tell you I haven't achieved one. So the question is, what, a, what is the experience of a true meditative state? Um, uh, so there's uh, descriptions of meditative states. And then with those, let's say, let's say in terms of, um, let's say in terms of concentration meditation, then there comes a point where there is an associated physical bliss and an associated mental bliss where the body feels completely light and uh, mm, it becomes very supple. The mind becomes very supple, the body becomes very supple. So that's, that's like from a concentration meditation. If we, for instance, start talking about the generation of love, if we're talking about generating love to all living beings, then as that, that, um, that love is generated, 
then you know there's no space in your experience for any anger or resentment or competitiveness and so from that then also there would be a great joy a joyful state and a blissful state from from that experience so there would you know even in an analytical meditation where you you're you're cultivating um let's say you're contemplating the benefits of having a loving kindness attitude to all sentient beings then as you actually are embracing that mind there will be an experience associated with that maybe an openness uh, a loss of any barriers a loss of any tightness or you know um, you know a loss of your miserliness or your clo you know that that com competitive combative feeling would evaporate and so then there would be an experience from that so but you know we we start from where we're at so we meditate for a few minutes and if we focus just on the breath we are giving ourselves a holiday from distraction and habitual negativity for maybe we're giving ourselves a holiday from habitual negativity that can feel can feel really pleasant because it might be something we've never had before because we've never been able to stop that mental chatter or stop that persistent um, anger the persistent sort of jealousy persistent negativity in our mind so we can we can feel sometimes good feelings in a meditation but if you start talking about actual mental you know uh, acquired mental states you know they're, um, they're I think certainly for me they're a fair way down the track so yeah, yeah. yes yeah Yeah, so the question is about how anger can arise like just so quickly, so, you know, and, and you're not even aware, and then all of a sudden you find yourself so angry. And the question is whether I'm talking about doing the analytical meditations after that. Yeah, and, and the answer is that when we're in that state, when anger has overwhelmed our mind, we're generally not in a position to meditate. <laughs> and if somebody says if somebody says hold on a second you should analyze where this came from you know we're just not interested at that moment and so so the process that we uh, the process for us to engage in is is looking at what happened yesterday you know at the end of the day you know at the end of the day reflect on what happened during the day and and there might have been a, a period during the day where you were very angry so you can then analyze it and the, what happens then is that that process of analysis starts to convince you that the anger is destructive you know it reinforces through your own intelligence and your discrimination that there is a problem with anger because at the moment we don't really think there's a problem with anger. We think that anger serves to protect me and it serves to preserve my happiness. You know, that's what we think. So the analytical meditations enable us to start to see the faults of anger. And it, they can, analytical meditations can start for us to see the real benefits of love and compassion to see the benefits of patience to see the benefits of loving kindness you know because we at the moment we may not actually think there's much benefit so analytical meditation enables us to to see the benefits you yeah, still got a question
meditative states. Uh, so yeah. You hear this business about um, an aspiration itself, a desire, can be actually um, prevent progress, can, can be detrimental to progress. But that desire can actually move through and achieve a significantly different state, can be detrimental to progress. So is that a question? Is <laughs> Uh, so the question or the, the, the reference is that the aspirational state um, can be a progress to, it uh, can be a, an opponent to making progress, is it? Yeah. So um, I'm going to say, first of all, I'm going to say no, and then I'm going to say yes. But the, so the first bit, let's say we say no. And it depends on what you mean by that aspirational thing. So the wish to be happy is a, an innate, let's say, it's, let's say it's an innate aspiration, the wish to be happy. Completely legitimate. You know, the wish to be free from suffering, the wish to be happy, completely legitimate birthright of every living being. Okay. So... You could call that an aspiration, but it's a legitimate aspiration. Um, the aspiration to be, to be a highly realized being, you know, to be a great saint, to be a Buddha, to be, to be a, you know, a, a, some highly realized being is a problem because it's an egocentric sort of... Uh, reinforcing the ego type of thing. And, and so there's a, a Zen koan, which you've probably heard, about if you see the Buddha on the road, kill him. And that's, that koan, you know, that uh, meditative, meditative uh, point to think about is about this sort of uh, glorious view of yourself that you make a little bit of progress and you think you've reached a destination. And so it's a, it's a lie. It's a, you know, it's a deceiving lie about your actual uh, ability. And so if you start to have those grandiose thoughts, then destroy them. You know. Neil. Yeah, so Neil's just referring to the, the sort of the practice of, of, and it is actually the mind states of mindfulness and introspection. It's the ability to see what is happening in your, in your mind at the beginning of a problem, not at the end of the problem. So our normal experience is that, that, that anger or jealousy or lust or pride, you know, we only become aware of it when we're well and truly established it in our mind. You know, we are so overtaken. We're so overtaken by the lust that I am completely blinded to any problem, you know, any fault, any hesitancy. I'm overcome so much by the anger that I am oblivious to any sort of argument that it's... That it's uh, Un, un, um, unjustified you know I've become blinded by the delusion so uh, you know Neil's referring to sort of trying to develop the quality that sees the seed starting to grow and then making making a move to overcome that at that point you know and that that is the practice to try to come to to that, that cutting it off before it's grown too strong. And that's where mindfulness and alertness is, uh, are absolutely indispensable. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the question or the statement here is about making the affirmations. The affirmations that, you know, nobody can harm me, you know, and making the affirmations that whatever they say, I'm, I'm not affected by it, okay? So, look, my feeling about the affirmation sort of approach is... Um, you know, it's fine saying that stuff, but in practice, in practice, there will always be something that circumvents that and catches us off guard. And so just making the affirmation is not an antidote. You know, that... Yeah, so I would place the affirmations into the aspirational basket. The affirmation is an aspirational statement. It's not in itself an antidote. You know, and, and maybe next few weeks we can start talking about antidotes. So I think the, you know, um, somebody saying, make America great is an aspirational affirmation, right? It's not necessarily fact, you know, in that context. You know, just making the affirmation is in itself not neither the truth nor an antidote to the problem, you know? So the, but look, a lot of people like affirmations. You can put them on your fridge, you can see it every day. Your mind does a, the, your mind a, a, acclimatizes to that aspiration, so you know uh, to that affirmation. So I'm, I th affirmations are good. And let's say in the, the the Buddhist context, you know people say mantras all the time. You know mantras, Om Mani Padme Hum. You know Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Soha. The essence of the of the mantra is aff affirmation. It is an affirmation, but it's an a it's, and it's an aspirational affirmation, but it needs to be coupled with states of mind. You know, it needs to be coupled with the state of mind so that the... Yeah. Yeah, so the, the affirmation is a climatization of your mind to that, to that aspiration. You know, the affirmation acclimatizes your mind to that aspiration, but then you have to practice. And so that's, in a way, that's what I'm saying here. We have this, uh, we have this body of aspirational thought, you know, Buddhism, Christianity, the Ten Commandments, the... The thought transformation, these are aspirational things. And then there's our practice. And we have to bridge the gap between the affirmation, let's call it an affirmation. You know, the affirmation that's on your fridge, you have to bridge the gap between what's on your fridge and what you're doing in your daily life, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's on an embroidered little picture in the front door. Yeah. Yeah. No, look, these are good things. You know, remind yourself of the of the affirmation, you know. Nothing there's nothing wrong with embroidered affirmations in the picture frame on there. Yes, Janet. Well, you're probably a better person than I am, Janet. So, <laughs> so each one of us, each one of us has got a different, we come into this life with a different habituation history. You know, we have, we are, <clears throat> we are entrapped by our habituation history. 
And that's why some people from birth are good people. Some people from birth are angry, some are jealous, some are whatever. Some are, some are angry, you know. So we all come in with a different habituation history, okay? Some people can ripen their mentality very quickly, and for others it's a struggle. But for each one of us, it's individual. It's individual. We have different, we have different uh, dispositions and different problems, sort of different problems. You know, somebody has a problem with anger, somebody has a problem with pride, somebody's got a problem with lust. In general, all of us have a problem with everything, but to varying degrees. So, and so we have, to, each one of us has got a path to try to tackle what, you know, I have a path to tackle my problems. So, you know, and partly I say these things, you know, uh, but I was much worse when I was young. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, look, it's... It, it's it, I, I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't think... I, would, I felt that I had made no progress and I didn't think this was valuable. So, um, it is valuable and I've made some progress. <laughs> So, okay, let's, um, are there any other questions we can, so let's, uh, oh, there was one, was there? So we, the question is about noticing the um, the bud, the bud or the kernel of let's say anger developing. So um, it depends on whether you have convinced yourself that anger is destructive. So you may see that that bud of anger developing and love it. You know, great, now I'm getting fired up. I'll be really able, I'll get so fired up, I'll be able to do something. So seeing the, the kernel or the bud or the, the seed of anger in itself is neither beneficial nor non-beneficial until you've convinced yourself that anger is destructive. So that's why the analytical thing is so important. You've got to get to a point where you, where you are so convinced that anger is destructive, that, that uh, pride and competitiveness and arrogance are harmful, that jealousy, jealousy is a deception to your own happiness. Because you know, if you're not convinced of that, you'll just jump in, you jump full bore, and you'll tell all your friends about why you are so jealous and you just build it up and build it up because you actually think that it's beneficial to you to be jealous. So that's why you have to, you have to come to a point where you are absolutely convinced that anger is destructive. In even its smallest amount, it is incredibly destructive. So until you've worked that out, whether you see the seed of anger developing or you see, you see this, let's say you see, let's say for instance you're a politician and you're in charge of sticking people on this island or that island or something and you start to see the seed of love and compassion developing, you might say, this is not going to get me re-elected, better crush that, you know. So it's important to know what is valuable and what is harmful. And if you see the seed, if you see the seed of kindness developing, then you nurture it because you know that it's valuable. Okay, so just think 
all of us thinking, meditating together, talking, asking questions is something very valuable and that that takes the, the form of a ball of white light in the middle of the room. Everybody, everybody's sort of positiveness, you know, is in that, that ball of white light. And then bring it above your own head, so it's hovering above yourself, and let it pour down into you, completely filling your body, and also completely filling your mind with clarity, and uh, all negative states banished. So you think your mind completely clear and your body also completely clear. And then have that, let that light all gather at your heart in the form of a big white egg, clear light, just made of light. And then thinking about everyone else here in the room how they, they all have problems, they all lack happiness and they all unfortunately have suffering, different types of suffering, physical and mental. And then imagine rays of light go out to everybody else in the room and overcome all of their mental and physical suffering and establish them in a great happiness And then, even then, to your family and those close to you, wherever they are, imagine rays of light go out and completely free them from any mental or physical suffering and establish them in happiness and joy. And even then, to your enemies, to those people you dislike or who, who you think dislike you, the same thing. They want happiness and they want to be free from suffering, but they actually lack happiness and they experience suffering. So in the same way, the rays of light go out. And in fact, to every living being, so visualizing every living being in front of you, they all want happiness and want to be free from suffering, but they actually lack happiness and they, they experience suffering. And so imagine the rays of light go out and establish every living being in happiness. And take a great sense of delight or joy or meaning, like this is something extremely meaningful to be able to do this. And then imagine that the rays of light all return and dissolve into you. So thank you very much, and um, I'll be back next week. And um, look, you can, if you're interested, you can sort of mark in your calendar on Sunday the 28th, I think it is, I'm doing a one-day course, uh, and there's some posters out there about it. So um, the topic is slightly different to this, but it'd be a similar, similar sort of content. So. If you if you're keen to come, you know, please um, please book in through the office, and I'd like, love to see you. So thank you very much. <laughs>